Good evening to everybody and uh, thank you for joining us for day two of this Emancipatory Futures Study Seminar uh, with Dr. Sumangala de Modren. Uh, the Emancipatory Futures Studies Knowledge Project is about exploring ways in which the subaltern anticipates, thinks and acts uh, around futures. And uh, Dr. de Modren has introduced us to the radical impulse in music yesterday and uh, is going to be building on that today in terms of her talk. The readings are available for those who are participating. And um, I'm now going to hand over to her. But keep in mind, we're in a hybrid space. Um, once she concludes speaking, uh, please post comments, um, questions. Um, I'll be posting from this physical space uh, with the audience here, uh, their questions and comments as well, like we did yesterday. Over to you, Sumangala. <coughs> Thanks, Vish. Yeah. Um, is that okay? Am I audible? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> I hope I'm audible to the virtual audience as well. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you let um, Yeah. Thanks again for inviting me to give these talks, and <clears throat> especially after yesterday. Um, it gave me a lot of, the questions actually gave me a lot of food for thought. And so I decided to structure today's uh, talk um, essentially around issues of knowledge production and you know how the idea of the radical impulse, um, even though it's something that came out of a specific project, you know, trying to understand um, the music that came out of the late anti-colonial movement and the you know, early post-independence period in India's history. <clears throat> and I found that there were resonances in different ways in different parts of the world, but um, uh, it's also led me to think more substantially um, in directions about questions of knowledge production and the hierarchies that are inherent within um, <clears throat> uh, you know, knowledge production. Uh, so, so what I'm going to do today is to go a little deeper into questions of aesthetics, politics, power, and about the knowledge production hierarchies that arise out of a conceptualization of the radical impulse. So what I'm trying to do over here is something that uh, actually came out of the questions yesterday. And I thought carefully about it this morning and structured a talk in, you know, this is work in progress. And therefore, I'm hoping, you know, you will be able to help me think through some of this more substantially. So <clears throat> before um, I um, sort of proceed uh, substantively, there is one uh, concept that I want to introduce. And this is, an, this is a concept that I find very useful. And it's something that um, an Iranian, um, I think she's a sociologist who writes about music and about uh, world music. And <clears throat> she talks about the idea of the oral imaginary. Um, and uh, so the oral imaginary, according to her, is an affective site to which we are attached, which consists of all the different oral sensations and exposures that we've had <clears throat> in our own lives. Uh, so it's something that that talks about the individual and the world that that individual inhabits in terms of the oral. Um, and this is, uh, I find it a very, very useful concept. Uh, although she, I think talks about it in a more limited sense in terms of trying to understand what this move towards listening to world music is about. So if there's something, somebody sitting in South Africa and listening to music in Bhojpuri from, uh, you know, Northern India, uh, without understanding the language, how does that person hear it? Um, you know, uh, so, that, that, so, so she's asking this question about uh, how questions of race, caste, class, gender affect the way in which people hear other people's musics. Mm, uh, but uh, that's a very specific set of questions that she's asking, but I find this, this idea very interesting. Um, and in my own classes <clears throat> that I teach at Ambedkar University, uh, I ask students to go through a set of uh, questions and you know, there's a small exercise that we do in class, which is to say that, what do you listen to? 
what do you listen to what do you like listening to you know try and think about classifying them in different ways however it doesn't have to be a technical classification you know do you like rock do you like pop do you like uh, um, classical music do you like indian music do you like western music and so on and so forth so i give them a series of questions uh, to think about what do you listen to has that changed over time uh, what has that changed with respect to has it been because you moved away from a rural area to delhi to study and therefore got exposed to something some things which were new was it because you rebelled against your parents and decided to start listening to music which parents disapproved of you know uh, so what i try to do is to get them to write down what are the different kinds of music that they like that they listen to how they listen to them you know is music listening about sitting down and listening carefully to music is it about plugging in earphones and you know listening to music on the go um, and and so on so um, this exercise essentially is very useful in order to be able to construct this oral imaginary what is the world of sounds that i am part of and then from there we move towards why do you think this has happened why do you think you like a certain kind of music why do you uh, are there kind are there specific kinds of music that you hate that you dislike so what are these you know likes and dislikes structured by and then we try and look at it in terms of and, and often people are able to um, say that you know related to a particular incident that you know there, there was one particular incident that exposed me to a certain music that blew my mind completely and therefore i like it or it could also of course be related to trauma i mean you know you might associate certain kinds of music with certain traumas in your life and say therefore i hate it and so on so <clears throat> these questions of likes and dislikes in terms of the world of sound in terms of the world of music how are it how is this associated with location in society uh, you know within the family within neighborhoods within uh, you know places that people um, uh, inhabit on a daily basis uh, places that people go to once in a while and so on and so forth so so um so um you know Roshna Kesti, this author that I'm talking about, uh, you know, I'm just quoting her. We love and hate our affects. Are proud of some of them, embarrassed of others. Wish we could do without this one, yet would never dream of letting go of that one. How are effective sites structured and arrived at within the oral imaginary? So the the whole question of affect. How does music affect you? And what are the senses that are being mobilized in a response? Uh, to music of different kinds so <clears throat> so from there then in in constructing this oral imaginary uh, which might be individual but of course is also social uh, <clears throat> we go on to looking more carefully at listening itself so what is the experience of listening about and in a few minutes you'll understand why i'm focusing on this <clears throat> what is what senses are mobilized and how do they link up with societal structure so do we listen with our ears do we listen with our skin do we can't people who are um um uh, you know impaired um uh, with regard to hearing and and speech hear don't they listen okay people uh, so how how did beethoven compose after he lost uh, his sense of hearing so so that there have been lots of studies about how sound and music actually affect us and also lots of experiments that have been done on which part of the body is involved actually in the process of listening now why is this important at all how does this connect with societal structure um <clears throat> which is where i want to actually slowly start talking about knowledge production and the way in which the hierarchies of music and music production have taken place ha have been established globally um <clears throat> one of the major distinctions that one can find between the west and the non west if we want to put it uh, in that way is that a large part of performativity musical performativity is part of what are what i call composite performances 
it's very rarely that music is only performed as music or, the, or there are only very specific kinds of music which are performed as only music. They are usually part of composite performances where there is an interaction um, of oral, physical, visual elements. And this is a very important dimension that we would need to understand in order to uh, arrive at the politics of sound production and the way in which it, it has been understood. So, so for example, Western classical music can be written down. And the superiority of Western classical music, it has been argued, is because it can be written down. It can be written down also because at a particular stage in the development of Western classical music, the tempered scale was invented, which is, and which is, which actually runs counter to the natural acoustic world. Uh, so the tempered scale gets invented, the piano as an instrument gets invented, where a scale can be broken up into notes which are equal, uh, equidistant to each other, and therefore can be mathematically divided into very precise units. So therefore, any note that's produced by the piano supposedly can actually be written down. Whereas the world of sound, the natural world of sound does not operate in that way. Uh, now, it, what is interesting is that, you know, it's okay, if some, are, some people want to create music which is of equal temperament, they should be free to do it. But the problem has been with the hierarchy that got established of that actually being superior music. And superior music, because it can be written down, which, me, which meant that music can be seen. So it's essentially music that can be seen that is superior music. And someone like Max Weber actually writes in the Rational Foundations of uh, Classical Music, Western Classical Music, that, uh, that it is superior because it is, you know, it is rational. Um, and it's a very, very systematic collection of notes which can be put down systematically and rationally. And therefore, non-Western music, he characterizes as a random agglomeration of semitones. So it's an agglomeration, it's not a carefully, uh, you know, arranged uh, set of uh, notes, it's random. Um, and it, it consists of semitones, which, which, which are notes that come between the major, you know, the, the significant um, uh, units of, of any scale. So, now I'm pointing this out to say that this whole visual idea of music um, and the idea that you know musicians would actually uh, be um, uh, you know completely not able to play the music if they're not able to see it. Whereas that's not true in a country like India, for example, there's very little music that is seen. You can, you might use it as a device to help you remember something. Uh, but but there's very little music that actually needs to be seen to be performed. Now, as I said, it's a matter of choice. You might choose to do something, but the problem is if you assert that there's a certain hierarchy which makes one superior to the other. So, um, so this is the reason why I'm pointing out this whole thing about multi-sensorial sensibilities that go into the listening of music. But at some point, these the oral gets separated from the visual, and you know, there are, there are scholars who've talked about, you know, acoustic modernities versus visual modernities and so on. And, you know, there's a lot of scholarship which actually looks at, uh, looks at uh, this kind of uh, issue. Uh, so in many societies, and especially societies where music does not get necessarily notated rationally and completely in the way in which it can be done with Western classical music, um, music, is a synesthetic experience. And it's something that, that utilizes multiple sensibilities of the body, but it also gets performed not only as music, but involving various other uh, 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 you know, dimensions of performance, which could be dance, which could be movement, which could be uh, you know, visual art, uh, but it also uh, becomes substantially part of ritual, uh, you know, life events, uh, life cycles, and so on and so forth. So, um, so therefore, performance, performativity, and 
their symbolism are complex and they are governed by principles that vary across contexts, but very interestingly might produce surprising resonances as well. So, uh, so, so the, the whole uh, art of music production therefore would tend to mobilize a whole range of different symbols which come from ritual, which, comes from, which come from the ways in which societies are structured, which come from cultures of listening, which come from the ways in which audiences are structured, patronage systems, and so on. And the, and the variety is immense. Um, but as I said, sometimes absolutely surprising resonances come up uh, because of course, people are all dealing with the world of sound, which comes from nature. Uh, but also because there have been historical connections between societies which often do not, uh, you know, become obvious to us unless you actually start exploring uh, these resonances. So, um, so therefore, knowledge tends to be inherent in performance itself on the one hand, and this is something that is being asserted by scholars and musicians and activists from uh, who, are, who are combating the dominance of particular kinds of knowledge production in the arts uh, to assert that there is knowledge that is inherent in performance itself on the one hand and uh, performances have surrounding symbol pools. Now this is a term that I've taken from uh, the cultural scholar from India, A.K. Ramanujan, uh, who talks about these symbol pools uh, which need to be understood together in order to be able to understand the significance of any particular uh, form. So, um, so these, so there are there's, there, there, there's knowledge, there are debates, that there, there's historical change uh, imbued in performance forms to various degrees. Now, uh, what happens then is that when there are these performances and the whole symbol pools associated with performances, performative traditions, power gets embedded into them through institutions, education, the possession of taste, etc. So, uh, so there are performances which arise from different kinds of people in society. And historically, it's, it's also been seen that across the world, um, some of the most varied performance forms have come from those who uh, have are at the bottom of society in in terms of hierarchy. And uh, you know, the in, in India, for example, some of the best musical traditions or the best craft and art traditions have come from people who are very low in the caste hierarchy, or from people who belong to religious religious uh, you know um, uh, denominations which have historically been marginalized. So, for example, there's a lot of music that comes from Muslims. Uh, and especially from Muslim communities, which have historically faced uh, oppression. And there's the, you know, uh, art forms, musical forms, which um, come from um, people who belong to the lower castes and particularly from what are called Dalit communities. So while that is true, the way in which the performance gets received and the way in which the performance gets established, uh, performative traditions get established, um, are conditioned to through through institutions, whether it's the temple or the or the court or the state or whatever might be the institutions that patronize uh, patronize specific um, kinds of performances. The degree of education and and th that becomes a way in which the separation happens between those who have taste and those who you know do not possess taste. Um, so um, now. Bourdieu has, has written about distinctions which are based on a notion of taste. And he has argued persuasively that uh, these distinctions about who possesses higher taste and who does not have high, you know, good taste uh, are more about power than about aesthetics itself. Um, uh, but what is interesting is that uh, these ideas of who has greater taste or not is also based on notions of the relationship that the artist has with the artwork. So very often uh, there has been a denigration of an emotional appeal. And this, this, this is something again that comes from the West 
very significantly. In, in Western classical music, the critic is at the top. The performer is much lower, the composer or the conductor is higher, and the critic who might or might not play the instrument or, or play is considered at the top. So, and, and the reason why it's, the critic is considered as a top, at the top is because the critic supposedly has the ability to stand back from a work of art and to be able to rationally understand it. Whereas the performer or the craftsperson who produces a piece of work is somebody who responds emotionally to it uh, and therefore you know, cannot assess it rationally. So interestingly, therefore, so even when there is an acknowledgement that somebody who's a performer is a, is a bloody good performer because you can't say so-and-so doesn't perform well, but then you say, oh, you know, but he's a good performer. Uh, you know, but does he or she have the ability to stand back and, and critique it dispassionately? Uh, that belongs to people of taste and, you know, who are those who are able to do this kind of a critical analysis dispassionately. And that association of taste with education, with literacy, and with the possession of uh, the instruments that allow them to, uh, you know, to sort of... Um, display their taste uh, becomes important. And now this is something that characterizes all societies and it's, you know, it's about power. Uh, so wherever there is power, there is bound to be this distinction between higher art forms and lower art forms, uh, uh, declared so by people who possess power. But what I want to point towards from here is, if this is the case, what do we then mean by a colonization process? And consequently, what is a radical challenge to colonization, both internal as well as external? Because I think, I mean, we are all in contexts where questions of decolonization are being debated, um, you know, uh, quite intensively. Uh, and, um, if we use this question of the judgment of taste and the relationship between ideas of taste and social hierarchy and the separation, actually the, you know, the non-association of ideas of taste with actual aesthetics, but essentially it's, it's reflection of power. Um, we can then talk about colonization, which is not only about countries colonizing another country, but also about internal colonization processes, which involve multiple um, identities. So um, the radical impulse then has to reckon with varied kinds of power. And, uh, you know, we were talking yesterday about, uh, you know, are there limits to the radical impulse? You know, and I, that's what got me thinking about it. That uh, does it stop? A critique after a point, you know, are you satisfied with the degree to which questions have been asked? And, you know, this is how I have formulated a response to this, that the radical impulse has to continuously reckon with various kinds of power. And as power gets structured and restructured in societies um, uh, continuously. So whether it's colonial power, whether it's racial, caste, class, ecological, interstate, north-south hierarchies, the radical impulse then has to constantly interrogate these different kinds of hierarchies in order to be uh, truly radical. So then what does a decolonization entail? No easy answers, I don't have an answer, but it does mean taking cognizance of pasts, multiple pasts, um, and I'm saying pasts specifically with a as a plural, because we are in India, we are very seriously debating questions about the past. Um, and, you know, whereas, whereas several of us are associating the past with many pasts. Um, so uh, it does mean then taking cognizance of the pasts, social formations, race, gender, caste dynamics. And a decolonization process, first and foremost, needs to counter various kinds of centrisms. Uh, so while one might actually talk about you know, um, disassociating from a knowledge production that uh, gives 
an advantage to the West, what has happened as a result of um, some of these, this kind of questioning is the establishment of alternative centrisms. And my own position on it uh, has been that a certain centrism cannot get countered by another centrism. And again, I come from a country where uh, from the anti-colonial you know, movement onwards, there's been a great deal of pride in indigenous knowledge and our own spirituality and our own uh, you know, superiority as a civilization and so on, which is a dangerous alternative centrism. Um, so uh, what is fascinating then is that if we use what I would consider a relatively egalitarian and just lens to assess aesthetic political movements, and in this case, you know, that we are discussing here, understand performance and performativity in their social context, as well as the location of individuals within that, we can begin to address questions of decolonization as being continuing processes. And um, uh, to battle a hierarchy ridden demeaning at one end, which comes from classic colonization, but also battling a kind of essentialism at the other. So that would be what my position is on this. And I think I'll stop here. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll just play. Um, a piece that uh, you know is from the Insurrections Ensemble, um, and it's a it's an ensemble of poets and musicians uh, from India and South Africa, and we have been trying to engage with each other with a lot of these questions in mind. Um, you know, so how do we play with each other? How do we perform with each other? How do we find resonances? Um, you know, between cultures which uh, very rarely have actually directly interacted with each other. Uh, and it's been mostly through the West, uh, you know, negotiated through the West, you meet in London or you meet in New York, or, you know, you, you need the mediator uh, from the West, but it's, very, it's, it's not often that, uh, you know, artists from this country interact directly with artists from, um, uh, from India without it being sponsored by the state or any other, uh, uh, you know, mediated by any other um, uh, uh, country or, you know, powers. So, um, and we've been trying to work with one important question, that what is the relationship between word and sound where we come from? Can we actually find resonances across these different cultural traditions? Uh, and look at the relationship between word and sound that allows us to co-create and co-compose. Um, you know, so in practice, is it possible for us to not think of hierarchies? Uh, so, so now this has been an ongoing project for 10 years now, and uh, uh, we've uh, produced a lot of uh, work, but what I'll do is to um, share screen and sorry, just give me a little bit. I can't seem to find. Should I just share the link with the uh, with Charles? Okay. Can you not can you not share a link yourself? Um. Yeah, it's not showing. I don't know whether it's coming up when you press share screen. Yeah, just a minute. Let me just see. It'll be one of the tabs on your browser. Yeah. But 
Can can you hear? Is it, is it coming from here or from through the? Can can they hear it? So this is a song which is called the Insurrection of the Flowers. So we wrote a series of poems called the Insurrection. I mean, you know, essentially trying to talk about insurrections of people all over the world. This was just around the time that Marikana had happened here, and various things had happened in India, and. We were also talking about nature rebelling, and <laughs> we are sitting in the middle of it. So, so there's this song that was written called "The Insurrection of the Flowers," which is about flowers just rebelling, and capturing cities, and things like that. So, this is that song. <laughs> Oh, ninja. 
शाख छोड़ी गुलशनों के दस्त में आए अमीने रंगो भूने हो बहा कर कहर पर पाए कोई कीमत मरासिम की न कोई कद्र जानों की शहर में हर तरफ लूटी गई असमत मकानों की कहीं नरगिस कहीं मरियम कहीं सुम्बुल कहीं सोसन खिलाफत यूं भी होती है
Yeah, so that was a long piece. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, so Lloyd has a question. Um, Music is often discussed in some form of, as some form of art that has an audience. I'm interested in knowing the agency of the listener in the hierarchies of power. Well, um, excellent question. And, uh, uh, you know, the hierarchies of power would work both ways as far as listeners are concerned. Uh, because um, you could have the listeners dictating, uh, you know, through powers, through, through patronage, for example, uh, when there are patronage systems um, uh, you know, that come from the courts or religious institutions or the state, for that matter, there is power embedded in the listeners themselves or the ones who are patrons of, uh, of music. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you could actually have uh, powerless listeners as well. So, uh, so and, and a lot of radical imaginings in music have to do with negotiating this relationship between the, between the performer and the listener. Um, so, um, so, you know, there is a lot of scholarship, for example, on the constitution of listening communities. Um, there is a colleague uh, from India who has actually coming up, come up with this fantastic idea of the musicophiliac. She has this word, uh, she's written a book about musicophilia in Bombay. Uh, you know, where she talks about the, these communities of music crazy people uh, who are those who perform and those who listen as well, who uh, set up particular kinds of listening cultures. So, so she talks about the way in which the North Indian classical music tradition, uh, despite being something that would be imbued with hierarchy in the way in which one would associate with classical traditions actually got disseminated in a very democratic way in the way in which it actually happened as urbanization took shape in Bombay in the early part of the 20th century. So she's actually done fantastic work among people who were the regular listeners of classical music and they were not associated with the powers that be in any sense, but people who just loved music. So, um, uh, so how, how does this musicophilia really as a phenomenon, um, you know, uh, affect uh, the creation of listening communities? Uh, so, so, that, that's, um, so, so of course you could have, um, uh, um, you know, you, you, you could have tremendous agency for the listener uh, and a lot of, so, so when, when, cultural movements, for example, where political movements have very consciously um, harnessed music for specific purposes in order to create consciousness about the way people live or whether it's an anti-colonial, anti-racial consciousness, um, what they have done is actually to create these cultures of listening and take forms from traditional contexts and you know, into contexts where uh, people listen in large gatherings, for example. So that's precisely about forging particular kinds of listening communities. So this could happen to reinforce power. It could also happen to decentralize power and to actually do a lot of radical politics. That's my response to Lloyd's question. Yeah. Um, so at the beginning, you were talking about the hierarchies and how the written form then provided grounds for hierarchizing Western, especially classical music. When did jazz come about? And mm. is there much of jazz not written? And mm. so, and that is from, I mean, my you know, um, limited understanding mm. is actually a highly respected form and is it considered Western? Mm. Well, um, and, I mean, jazz did challenge the orthodoxy tremendously when it came into existence because it was actually picking up um, sounds and tones and notes which were not necessarily acceptable within the Western classical canon. 
So, um, and that's that's exactly the you know the random agglomeration of semitones that uh, mm-hmm. Max Weber was talking about. Yeah, you know, so whether it's a semitone, yeah, whether it's a semitone or the quarter tone or the microtone, which characterizes uh, you know say typical Indian singing, you know what people do with their voices and so on. So you there, there are lots of spaces between notes that are explored, and that's how you know that's how singing happens. Um, so, so that's that's exactly what happened with jazz, isn't it? That sounds that were that came from slavery and from you know African origins of 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 slaves started getting introduced into what were Western instruments and Western styles of playing and 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 singing and so on. So. Um, um, the establishment was definitely unhappy. So some somebody like Adorno, for example, uh, wrote uh, with great deprecation about jazz. Uh, and uh, as an example of debased listening. And his argument was interesting because he was, uh, he was arguing for um, the availability of superior listening and superior forms of music like Western classical music, but capitalism, according to him, would debase listening and would actually, uh, you know, uh, re- result in the proliferation of inferior forms of of music, where jazz jazz included. Of course, he was uh, he was bitterly attacked <laughs> for for his position on that. But but it comes from this idea of so. Uh, uh, but then I, I guess jazz also got elevated uh, to something that uh, that is considered. A high form of music, and that I, I mean, I, I'm told I'm not an expert at all, but I'm told that there are similar hierarchies within jazz itself, um, uh, and also I, I, I think, um, I think a large part of it can be written down. I don't know. I'm, I'm not very sure about it. Yeah. So. Um, there are others who commented. Anita Nash Newman commented that the creative performing part of the allied work okay. Thanks you. Yeah, that's great. Basil Kala, thanks you. Mind, body, soul. Are there any other comments, questions, interventions? Yes. My name is Baba today. Yeah. Um, so why, Baba? <laughs> yes, yeah, so while we were discussing about the concept of the aura imaginaries, I was taught to, while listening to the, the, um, the performance, how do, um, so far, the subjectivity of the performer plays a, a particular role in the aura imaginary. How do we uh, look at the creation of these um, cultural troops, usually under the establishment? How can they um, reimagine their subjectivity to get across to the establishment? So far, we know that um, well, we cannot um, do without the establishment, but we need to engage them. How can, can the subjectivity uh, to reimagine um, the environment? Particularly for the challenge of the present challenge in the post liberal era, its economic challenge. How the music gets across to the government class? Mm. Well, um, I mean, I, I, I'm sure there are varied ways in which it happens in different parts of the world. Uh, so it would depend on, um, uh, you know, several questions. I mean, what forms would people use? Uh, you know, uh, so uh, often you would need to use. Uh, very familiar forms, uh, which everyone in that context understands or can reproduce. And then that, you know, that conveys a certain, and use uh, a message within that form to talk stridently about some, some important issue. So, um, so for example, India has this tradition of street theater, um, um, where people perform on the streets uh, and they use songs a lot. And, uh, but then, you know, these are plays that are that are 15 minutes or half an hour long. And they usually are, you know, at least that's how they came up. They were talking about pertinent issues that, that affect people's lives. It could be price rise, you know, uh, it could be non-availability of water. Uh, it could be, um, uh, you know, supporting unions which have gone on strike. So uh, you would need to go into the street and um, uh, perform very quickly and have you know an audience which quickly comes and surrounds you and, and have to say things very fast. So for that kind of a thing, you would need to use music which is easily accessible. So often people use you know Bollywood tunes, 
or uh, a, a, a very commonly known folk form. And you put in political lyrics or lyrics that can actually, um, you know, yeah, yeah, uh, give a direct message. And often that is the way in which uh, uh, you perform against the establishment also. So you go to the factory gate and, you know, perform um, calling out to the factory owner to come and respond to the demands uh, and so on. So um, there are any variety, any number of ways in which it happens. There, there have been, uh, you know, musicians who've written very complex music as well. Uh, and often that's what, uh, uh, you know, th that's what appeals. So if a, if a very famous classical composer actually composes music in defense of trade unions, like what happened with, um, with, the, uh, with, with many of the classical composers in the United States in the 1930s, very well-respected composers suddenly create this piece with the sounds of industrialism, as I was telling you. And that would certainly hit the establishment hard, you know? So, so um, yeah, the, people think about it in complex ways and often, often it's spontaneous. It's spontaneous and people understand what the message is. Yeah. Wow, Deborah. Um, it's not a question really, it's more of an observation. That in the beginning, when you spoke about the different ways we approach music and listen to music and what music we resonate with, um, I think that has a whole lot to do for me with the question that came later, I think from Lloyd, about um, the agency of the listener mm -hmm. um, in regards to the hierarchy of sound. And personally, I actually find that when I'm listening to music, because we were putting sound and word and putting the first two together. When I don't understand the lyrics, I find that I get the most out of the music mm. um, because I'm forced to approach music from an intuitive place. And I'm also fortunate enough to have an autonomic sensory meridian response. So my whole body, if I'm really immersed in the music, and of course it has to be loud enough and the environment has to be conducive, responds with tingles. Mm. Um, and so I just found that really interesting to me because it elevates the music to a more universal platform um, and speaks to its essence. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so uh, how does instrumental music appeal? You know, instrumental music is anyway music without words. And uh, how do how do people listen to instrumental music? Uh, you know, so, so that's, um, it goes to a place which doesn't need words, essentially in our, you know, in our being. Then the words become an instrument of your own. Yeah. And if I were to understand what the meaning was, it would almost attract because now I move back into mm. Um, an intellectual appreciation mm. or, or not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and these vary from individual to individual. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I know this this whole distinction between, you know, sitting down and listening to music. And a lot of my students say they can't listen to music sitting down because their generation has only, you know, I mean, has had the highest degree of exposure to music on the go, you know, whether it's on your cell phone or whether, uh, you know, with the invention of the Walkman onwards, you know, our generation knows the, the Walkman, right? Uh, so so from, from then onwards, uh, you know, music could be listened to on the move. Uh, whereas I can't think of my parents' generation ever listening to music on the move. I mean, that you, you, they wouldn't consider that serious listening at all. Uh, so, and these, these vary from generation to generation. They vary with the kinds of technologies that are available. And they also vary uh, with different kinds of listening cultures. Uh, you know, the highly formal listening to classical music, whether it's in the West or in other parts of the world, listening to classical music is a serious endeavor. Um, so then you wonder whether it's the sound which is important or the fact of sitting in a particular kind of way and clapping at the correct time and you know knowing when to clap and when not to clap, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, you know, so so it's curated by a whole you know set of activities which then establish its superiority. Uh, but at the same time, maybe maybe 
you know, two way listening is just about being able to close your eyes and concentrate on that. And, uh, you know, I can, I can't do much listening with earphones on and, you know, moving around all the time. I, I might, but that's superficial listening for me, but that might not be true for, uh, for others. So, yeah. Yeah, I have another question. Is it a follow up? Um, no, it's different. Okay, let me bring him in. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Ashwin. All right, uh, thank you, I'm Tatenda. So I was quite very interested uh, in your, when you discussed um, the ritual act, uh, okay. especially performance, per, uh, performing in the symbolic uh, context. I'm trying to think of it, especially because I have done something on indigenous knowledge. Mm. I've been, I've witnessed uh, a, a rainmaking ceremony. And my question to say, when you relate this to symbolic context, context uh, can we invoke questions of power? Or can we invoke questions of reclaiming space and music being uh, a tool for reclaiming space uh, and territory and everything that comes with it? Sure, absolutely. And um, so a lot of reclaiming efforts have involved uh, music that comes from these kinds of contexts uh, themselves because, because they mean things to people. Uh, you know, so whether it's a ceremony, now it's not that ceremonies are not imbued with power either. I mean, you know, uh, uh, power exists everywhere, wherever there is structuring of society, power exists. So it's not as if necessarily, you know, particular kinds of rituals might not be imbued with power, but it's, but at the same time, you know, rituals performed in social contexts carry certain kinds of meaning for the people who, who know uh, who are part of that that context, and that meaning can actually also be utilized differently. So, what what happens, for example, when uh, a chant or a a chant becomes a slogan? You know, say a ritual chant becomes a slogan. I mean, you know, call and response <laughs> in South Africa. I don't have to talk about you know. So uh, and and they come very often from ritual context, right? Particular ways in which people interact with each other around ritual, or you know, say you know, life cycle ceremonies. Uh, uh, so uh, so then that call and response when it gets imbued with a certain kind of a message, you know, for miners going on strike, or you know, uh, of people gathering. In, in any movement, um, then th that because it carries certain kinds of symbols, people find it very easy to respond to them. Um, and and, and so, so therefore the reclaiming could be of various kinds. It could be a reclaiming uh, of something that has disappeared for some reason because of colonialism, because of you know, power, because of uh, industrialism you know, uh, uh, or a big dam has been constructed and, you know, people have been displaced. Um, so, there could, so there could be a reclaiming that, that, that happens, which, uh, which tries to bring it back, but there could be a reclaiming for something else as well. And that history is replete with examples all of, of, you know, different kinds where, where this kind of re reclaiming happens. And... Yeah, I have a concept I was thinking. So, yeah. so I wanted to know if I'm yeah. But it makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Charles Zimali asks, how has the commercialization of the pleasure festival undermined the social function of music in the capital? Has the pursuit of platinum records undermined the social function of the capital? Mm. Yeah, again, this is a complicated question. And um um, yeah, commercialization of the pleasure principle. Um, yes, um, although I would say that the pleasure principle doesn't apply only when we are talking about commercialization. We do enjoy music, you know, and th there's no harm in it, in enjoying it. And it is because people enjoy music and associate themselves with particular kinds of musical traditions and so on, that the commercialization also becomes possible. So that's, in, in, in my own work, I've actually argued that the popular movement uh, becomes like the business enterprise, 
uh, in taking art forms to larger and different audiences, except that they are done for different purposes. Whereas, whereas a business is doing it purely for commercial purposes. So you know, you you take a music form from a localized context and make it available for a million views. Uh, and now that might be something that that is commercially lucrative and therefore it's done. But that's precisely what a movement would do as well, which is to be able to take the music of a musician, which makes sense to the movement and take it to much larger audiences. Uh, and uh, uh, so maybe it's, this, it's the pleasure principle or the politics principle or, uh, uh, you know, a popularization principle that actually uh, determines this. So, um, uh, the pursuit of platinum records undermine the social function of music. I'm not so sure. Uh, I'm not so sure because um, yes, I mean, commercialization means business and people making money. Uh, there's no doubt about it, but, but um, uh, the existence of these technologies could also uh, be used for democratic purposes. So the reason why uh, musicians and move, you know, musicians who come from movements often decide to go into commercial industry, for example, into films, uh, very often is to be able to reach those wider audiences. Uh, and so, so, so if platinum records have enabled the reaching across to wider audiences, it's possible. So I wouldn't decry that per se. Uh, except to say that if it's only for a commercial purpose, then, then um, you know, I would decry the way in which capitalism operates, uh, rather than saying the production of platinum records itself is a problem. Because that does enable a listener from far away to actually listen to something that exists very far away. So... Um, so you were talking about um, the degeneration of the emotional appeal yeah. um, and the hierarchy of, well, classical, traditional hierarchy of critics, and so it would go down. And, um, and then later on you said, well, you were questioning, can we think outside of hierarchies entirely? Is that even possible? Um, so I've lost the standard. So that was the standard. So is there a standard? Or, you know, where, what kind of agency or power does the artist now have? Hmm. No, when I was talking about uh, uh, the, the emotional appeal versus a sort of rational understanding of music, uh, what I was talking about was, um, um, a decrying of certain modes of performance and listening uh, that uh, either belong to people who are from lower strata of society within the hierarchy or from those parts of the world which were you know uh, colonized mm -hmm. so um, um, so um, i mean what i'm trying to argue over there is that um, you know, it doesn't make one superior over the other. Uh -huh. So, for example, so 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 for example, in India, um, when the national movement was building up, there were a whole bunch of theorists who were beginning to argue that we have our own classical tradition, and our and it's equally well developed, but we are superior to the West because we have a spiritual side to it. You know, uh, so. My argument would be that why do you need to establish superiority of anything for that matter? Yeah. If there are musics which uh, rely on a definition of superiority that comes from an emotional appeal or a spiritual appeal, uh, or there are systems of music which rely on an appreciation that comes from rationality, it doesn't matter. They're just different ways of doing it. it you know, is there a need to even establish a hierarchy either way. I mean, which is what, what I was saying at the end that, you know, often certain centrisms have been countered by alternative centrisms and they employ very similar kinds of arguments 
to say we are superior. And, and I would be wary of something like that. So each approach holds its own within what it is accomplished. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, Anita, I'll, I'll put Anita and then you. So, Anita asks from the trade union in Uganda, how can we overcome COVID 19 crisis? I wish I knew. <laughs> I, I wish I knew. I wish musicians could physically get together and play. <laughs> you know, but. This <laughs> happiness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. So, I mean, I don't think it's. it's it's less of a question, it's more, I think it's question comment. Um, so you mentioned, you know, the, the fact that the Western classical music was seen in a particular way before it could be written down. Uh, and, and so it had this kind of hierarchy of power. But is it also not linked to science? Because, you know, it became quite scientific, it became quite about physics and it linked to all of those, those kinds of knowledges, which in a hierarchy of knowledge, science kind of trumps almost everything else. And, and I'm wondering if that's why it was seen. So even people who would say things like, your baby must listen to classical music because then it simulates the brain and then, you know, all of those because of using the science to kind of give it a status. Mm. And and I'm just saying that that then links to other knowledges like science, mm. which is also has its colonial past. Mm. Uh, no, absolutely, absolutely. So this, the rationality of Western classical music came out of the whole uh, enlightenment rationality project. And with that, with, it came with the scientific temper and you know, being able to, uh, you know, so, so being able to mathematically write music down, yeah. obviously got associated with, although interestingly, uh, uh, you know, the natural world and the way in which sound appears in the natural world, which is science, okay, uh, does not correspond to the way in which uh, the sounds, uh, you know, whatever the notes were arranged in the Western classical system. So, uh, so, uh, so actually then, you know, as one of uh, my, uh, you know, music colleague says, you know, Indian music is actually more scientific because it follows the natural <laughs> physical world. Or, you know, non-Western music is actually more scientific. Uh, yeah, so, but, but this is endless, right? But you're right, absolutely. You know, so it was, it, it is arguments about rationality and scientific temper uh, and, uh, you know, and therefore not getting swayed by emotions like these natives do, you know, which is, which is also the way in which the colonial subject was talked about very often, hasn't it? You know, in the most um, generous um, view of the colonial subject, the colonial subject is childlike and doesn't really know what's good yeah. Yeah. for her, you know, and, and therefore needs to be taught what is good. That's the most generous, you know, so, yeah. Just to follow up on that. Yeah. Um, in terms of, you know, sound from below, sound from above, sort of knowledge hierarchy, what role does anthropology play in reinforcing that hierarchy, that sort of ethno music? Yeah, yeah. And so on. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, colonial anthropology, uh, you know, played a very dubious role. And so, and, and there was a, you know, um, I would say, uh, you know, so when, when the colonial anthropologists were going out into India and Indonesia and different parts of Africa trying to figure out what these funny sounds that the natives made were because it was not music, according to them. Uh, I think many of them also faced a genuine problem, which was, and, and, and this, this would be true of any of us. I'm sure there are different kinds of music that all of us are deaf to, yeah. you know, because we haven't heard it. We are not familiar with it. We don't like it. You know, so that's why there's that set of questions that I began with, what do you not like at all? You know, and why do you not like it? Often it could be that I'm just not exposed to it. Uh, you know, so so the colonial anthropologist very often probably could not even hear the sounds that were being produced because those sounds were coming out of those, you know, microtonal uh, musical systems, which, which, you know, so and music that you don't see, you don't hear, uh, you know, uh, now that's not a problem as long as there's no hierarchy. Uh, so, so, there, so there was that whole thing of, you know, trying even, even the most sympathetic 
of them, you know, not being able to hear a lot of the sounds. And uh, so, so the, the, the superiority of the Western, whatever colonial system of music then gets established through all these arguments. Uh, um, ethnomusicology, I would say, doesn't come out of the same uh, impetus. It comes out of the opposite impetus, but I still feel that the ethno uh, prefix sort of reinforces hierarchy in, in a different way. So the ethnomusicologists have, I mean, ethnomusicology comes into existence as a, as a sub-discipline uh, um, in order to, to understand the music of the others. That, they, that the others exist, the others deserve to exist, and let's try and understand you know, how communities produce music, what are the different traditions in different communities, but it's still governed by a notion of the ethnos. So you have musicology, which is about Western music, and ethnomusicology, which is about the other. Uh, and, and this is true about, uh, I, I, I mean, I'm told uh, that this is also true of uh, the music institutions in South Africa as well. Uh, where you know the the music department's primary uh, interest would be in the European classical tradition, and then you have jazz, and then you have African music, and 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 all of that. So musicology means musicology that comes um, that, that the analysis of music that is that is mostly European classical music, and the rest could be you know either jazz studies or ethnomusicology departments and so on. Which but but. In spirit, they were progressive, I think. Uh, but I still would be happy if the word ethno was not there. Are there, are there any final comments or questions in the room, um, in the chat group? Um, if there isn't, I'm just going to make one last appeal. Um, yesterday, you made a very, very profound intervention around the locating yourself. So, you know, you were not sort of music of resistance that was agitational and propagandistic and you also you were not about music for music's sake you were about beautiful music and i'd like you to demonstrate that to us in practice oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> it's a for one of my favorite songs okay yeah, that's a devious <laughs> move on your part. <laughs> Which is supported by all. <laughs> yeah, so maybe uh, I'll I'll just uh, Tell yeah I'll I'll I'll, I'll uh, mention a little bit about this song. So um, this is a song um, that was written at the time of the Second World War, and it's a song that uh, was um, written by. Uh, an Indian poet, uh, as he was witnessing the rounding up of a whole lot of very poor Indian people uh, to join the British army, you know, to fight in the Second World War. So he spontaneously wrote this song uh, asking, whose war are you fighting? You know, and you know, uh, I mean, like, like the song about the Mississippi that, you know, I talked about yesterday and, you know, the Indian song, which was talking about the Ganga flowing quietly while there was so much misery around her. This song was something like that, saying that, you know, do you, do you uh, see what the soldier's leaving behind and whose war are you fighting? Um, so this song um, was written by this poet in the 1940s and um, it, was, uh, um, it was used in a film in the 1950s at some point, but it's not a song that uh, really was part of the, you know, popular imagination. Um, now, in the 1980s, um, um, there was um, somebody called Sabdar Hashmi in Delhi, who was a theater activist, um, um, a cultural activist, who uh, then was assassinated, um, you know, because when he was performing, he and his group were performing a street play in support of trade unions, uh, uh, just on the outskirts of Delhi. Uh, but um, and he, he was assassinated on the 1st of January, uh, 1989. Um, and I'm talking about the year 1984. Uh, so, you know, he taught me the song um, in, in sometime in 83. And, you know, because it's a, he, he felt that it was a 
very evocative kind of a song which should be sung and um, so we first sang it in 84 um, after Indira Gandhi was assassinated um, in India the prime minister was assassinated by somebody who belonged one of her security guards who belonged to the Sikh community and um, the her party and the, the the whole I mean along with the support of the state went on a rampage killing killing people from that community I mean essentially killing men including newborn little boys from the community it was a pogrom it was a carnage in 84 and uh, the city was burning I mean large parts of North India were burning we could smell you know dead bodies um, and and uh, you know, buildings on fire and buses on fire and so on. And so, so um, this song was sung at a peace march, after a peace march um, through the campus of Delhi University, which is a huge university and, you know, appealing for calm and, and essentially trying to point out there was a citizens collective, which was formed, uh, which was essentially trying to say that this, look, this is political, this is not spontaneous. Um, and also appealing to the young people of that community not to retaliate because they were dying to just go out into the streets and avenge you know the murders so um, so this song was sung at that point and uh, uh, you know it had a, it had a an amazing effect uh, you know in, in a very angry atmosphere where it wasn't possible for anyone to give speeches where young people were not willing to listen the song just completely changed the atmosphere and you know, people went down on their knees and were weeping. And, and for me, as a, I was a young undergraduate student at that time, for me, it was the first example uh, of a song from an old context, a historical song, you know, and from a song written about the first wo a Second World War. It's an anti-war song, but which immediately produced a emotional and amazing response, uh, you know, in a situation of conflict. So, uh, so for me, it has a very deep personal history, the song, and then subsequently, it's been sung thousands of times, uh, I think. So, yeah, I'll sing that. <clears throat> My voice is, after so much speaking, not in good shape. <laughs> <coughs> सिपाही से पूछो वो कहाँ जा रहा है जाने वाले सिपाही से पूछो वो कहाँ जा रहा है कौन दुखिया है जो गा रही है भूखे बच्चों को बहला रही है लाश जलने की बू आ रही है जिंदगी है कि चिल्ला रही है जाने वाले सिपाही से पूछो वो कहा जा रहा है कैसे सहमे हुए हैं नजारे कैसे डर डर के जलते हैं तारे क्या जवानी का खून हो रहा है सुर्ख है आचलों के किनारे जाने वाले सिपाही से पूछो वो कहा जा रहा है गिर रहा है सियाही का डेरा हो रहा है मेरी जान सवेरा ऐ वतन छोड़ कर जाने वाले खुल गया इन कला भी फरेरा जाने वाले 
सिपाही से पूछो वो कहा जा रहा है जाने वाले सिपाही से पूछो वो कहा जा रहा है Thank you. Yeah, I hope it made sense in terms of. Yeah, it's making a lot of sense. Our black woman from Harvard is teaching. So many people, musicians, artists, everything. Yeah. Tomorrow, make sure. So I said, invite all your friends. Tomorrow's public. Sure, yeah. so I wonder what's not. You can find a recording of the song online. Yeah, I'll. Um, uh, well, yeah, it's there, but I'll, I'll send. I'll send. I'll send it to you, and yeah, you can circulate it.